Um, I'm assuming that if you're here today that you support changing the cannabis laws. So I'm not going to talk a lot about the benefits of cannabis medicinally and how it's a great therapeutic uh, benefit for a lot of ailments. And I'm not going to talk a lot about hemp and how hemp can help the environment and the, the industrial and, and environmental benefits of grow more cannabis hemp. And I'm not even really going to talk about the harms of prohibition so much and the incredible damage it does to individuals and families and the financial and social toll that prohibition of cannabis does. What I want to talk about is the effort to change the law and how I think we can change the laws to decriminalize and then legalize cannabis right here in British Columbia over the next few years. And uh, so my name is Dana Larson and I've been working at this for pretty much all of my adult life. Uh, as a student at uh, university, I started a club called the League for Ethical Action on Drugs and we put on events on campus and had speakers come and this was uh, in the early, uh, early 90s, uh, the time when hemp was so rare and we not very widely available. I'll just let these folks in. Yeah. You're accessible BC? Yeah, sorry, we just closed the door because they were having a dance party over there, although I guess they quieted down a little bit. Yeah, we missed anything. So, uh, yeah, at that time, where we had a, a speaker come over, a friend of mine, Chris Bennett, uh, who I just met at the time, he had a little square of hemp fabric and little bits of hemp paper, and we'd all pass it around. It's the stuff that we have never seen before. And uh, when I graduated from university, I went to work for Mark Emery, the Prince of Pot, and he's now in a prison in Yazoo, Mississippi, for selling cannabis seeds to the mail to Americans, or really he's in jail for funding the marijuana movement for many years and putting uh, many millions of dollars into the effort to legalize uh, revenue that he made from his seed business. And, uh, and during that time, I, I worked at Cannabis Culture Magazine, where I had a chance to learn a lot about the cannabis plant and the politics and history and culture around it. Uh, 2000 and 2001, I helped form the Canadian Marijuana Party and then the BC Marijuana Party. A couple of years later, I joined the NDP and I created a group called End to Prohibition that works within the NDP to develop better drug policies and policies around cannabis. And uh, I opened the Vancouver Seed Bank and uh, then a couple of years later, in 2008, I opened the Vancouver Medicinal Cannabis Dispensary. We now serve 4,000 patients in the Lower Mainland and actually all across Canada by mail order as well. And, uh, and uh, now I'm on tour with the Sensible BC campaign. And in all this time of doing all this effort, people have often said to me, you know, what are you getting so worked up about? It's just a matter of time until these things are going to change. It's inevitable that marijuana is going to be legalized, so there's no need to really get worked up about it. It's going to happen no matter what. And that, to my mind, is the totally wrong attitude and is not how things get done. There's no reason these laws could not perpetuate for another several decades or another generation. And in fact, I feel that in many ways right now we're in a similar place to where we were in the late 1970s. Late 1970s, there was head shops, there was cannabis culture information, it was widely available. In Canada we had Pierre Trudeau and Joe Clark, the two prime ministers at that time, both saying it was time to change the marijuana laws. In the US we had Jimmy Carter, president, saying it was time to change the cannabis laws. Many American states were having referendums to decriminalize cannabis possession and make it just a fine instead of a, a serious criminal penalty. And yet a whole generation has gone by. And these laws haven't gotten any better. In fact, they've gotten a lot worse. And there's no reason why that couldn't happen again. But at the same time, we have had many victories over the last 20 years or so uh, since I got involved in this. I've seen a lot of these things happen and helped some of them happen. Uh, for instance, cannabis hemp is now being grown legally in Canada. That was legalized in 1996 by the Liberal government. Uh, and so for the first time in, in many decades, we're growing a lot of cannabis hemp in, in Canada now, and although it's uh, still too tightly restricted and there's still too much red tape and there's still some problems with it, nevertheless, that's a big step forward. And, uh, and you know, also in Canada now we have ready access to bongs and pipes, which are really harm reduction devices. You don't have to get an old Coke can and punch some holes in it to, to smoke some cannabis anymore. You can get a, a nice, clean, pure, medicinal glass pipe or a nice bong or whatever, a, a water device, or even amazing vaporizers. And there's some incredible vaporizers on the market now as well. And, uh, and although these things are actually still illegal in Canada, all those things are still against the law uh, under section 462.2 of the criminal code, but that law is rarely enforced. The bigger of a city you're in, the less likely it's going to be enforced. The smaller of a town and the further north you go in Canada, the more likely you're going to have problems with that. Same with cannabis seeds. Those laws are still in the books. Selling marijuana seeds is still illegal. 
And of course, Mark Emery's in prison for exporting marijuana seeds to the US, but there's quite a few places across Canada now that sell seeds, and pretty much anybody in Canada can get good marijuana seeds by mail order, so they have access to a broad range of strains, and especially when you're growing for medicinal use, being able to find the right strain for your needs is very important. So a lot of Canadians have access to that now, but that law is still on the books. And, uh, and medicinal marijuana is also very widely available in Canada now. The government's growing marijuana, which, although it's low quality schwag, they've really made an effort to kind of wreck that cannabis by forcing them to mix it in stock and shred it up to reduce the potency. Nevertheless, they're growing cannabis, and that's a still a step forward in a good way. And even better than that, there's tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Canadians that now get access to medical cannabis through a dispensary. Uh, either one in their hometown or by mail order. And those are expanding quite rapidly across the country right now as well. But when we look at these things, um, for the most part, aside from the hemp cultivation, the laws have not changed. And in fact, the laws have gotten worse. And for the, the, the successes we've had have mostly been in civil disobedience and in ignoring the laws more than getting them to be ignored by the police rather than actually getting them changed. And in fact, at the same time that Washington and Colorado had their amazing success in having their referendums to legalize marijuana, the very same day in Canada, Stephen Harper's mandatory minimums came into play. Those laws were finally put into force. And so cultivation of just six plants in Canada will now get you six months in prison as a minimum sentence. And uh, growing larger number of plants, you'll see much longer sentences. In fact, that six months becomes nine months if you're growing in a rented home, if you have children in your house, or if they consider it to be a public safety hazard. And as far as I've seen, every single grow up they've ever found is considered a public safety hazard no matter what it looks like. So, and these penalties are quite severe. And there's also strong penalties for selling over, th over three kilos of cannabis, trafficking over three kilos. Well, I fall under that mandatory minimum. I run a medical marijuana dispensary. We have far more than three kilos on the premises. So myself and all my staff could have a year in prison, or a year and a half actually, because we rent the store that we do our business from. Even though we've been operating openly for many years, we would still fall under those mandatory minimums. And so when I look ahead to how we're going to change the laws and how we're going to have the success, I really, I look to the American states, Washington and Colorado, and the many other American states over the past few decades that have changed the laws. And in every single instance when they've allowed medical marijuana, or when I should add that at the same time Washington and Colorado did their thing, Massachusetts became the 18th state to legalize medical marijuana access. And that's an average of more than one a year since 1996 when California became the first state to allow medical marijuana through a referendum. And in all these instances, it's always been a referendum. It's never been a state government or a federal government, at least in North America, that's been the one making it top down. It's always come from the grassroots. And in fact, in those American states, every single time, the governors have campaigned against this legislation and then been put in the, into the role of having to enforce it and put it into place when they originally saying they didn't want to have it happen in the first place. And so we happen to live in the province of British Columbia, which is the only province in Canada that has a referendum system also. And it's actually harder to get something on the ballot here than it is in any American state. But it can be done, and I'm going to get back to that in a minute. But what I want to say is that we, we worked to try to figure out what we could do as a province to, to change these laws, what a British Columbia could do. So we got together with a lawyer named Kirk Tussaud. And Kirk's a brilliant lawyer. He's won us many victories in court in terms of expanding a medical cannabis access and also curbing some of the excesses of Harper's War on Drugs. And Kirk and I did a lot of research, and we figured out a way to decriminalize cannabis possession in British Columbia and to get us on the path to legalization. And the law we wrote is called the Sensible Policing Act. And the Sensible Policing Act is two main parts to it. The first part is to decriminalize cannabis possession in British Columbia. People say, how can you do that when these are federal laws? You can't change the federal law as a province. And that's entirely true. You can't. And we can't have a referendum on something if it's unconstitutional. The law's got to be a valid law within the jurisdiction of the province and all that kind of stuff. But provinces have jurisdiction over policing and over administration of justice. Every province and every provincial attorney general has the, the duty and the responsibility to tell the police in that province where to set their priorities, where to focus their resources, and where not to focus their resources, and what's not to be considered so important. And that's not like a technicality, that is the role of the Attorney General of every province. All the police in British Columbia, including the RCMP, are provincial police officers and they act under the authority of the Police Act, which is an act of the British Columbia Legislature. So what our legislation does, the Sensible Policing Act, is it amends the Police Act and it tells all the police in British Columbia to spend no time and no resources on searching or seizing or detaining or arresting anybody for possession of cannabis. 
Now, if you're a minor under the age of 19, we thought, well, there should be something in there to deal with that. We don't want minors going to prison and getting a criminal record either. That's more harmful for the most part than even the worst case scenario of using cannabis. Having a lifetime criminal record can be quite harmful. But we wanted some kind of control there. We thought that would be appropriate. So we decided to deal with cannabis and minors in exactly the same way as alcohol. The legislation specifies that a minor in possession of cannabis can be treated the same as, but no more, more, no more severely than a minor with alcohol. So a police officer could seize that cannabis, could potentially write them a ticket, but there'd be no handcuffing, arresting, no criminal record, none of those other kinds of things involved. And of course, a minor with a medical exemption would be treated the same as anybody else and would be allowed to possess their cannabis if they, had, if they fell under the legal medical system. So that's the first part of this legislation. And, and I'll say that we actually have a, a precedent for this idea quite recently where the provinces were taking control and telling their police what to do in defiance of a federal law. We had the Long Gun Registry quite recently. And then in 2003, British Columbia joined seven other provinces in saying that we're not going to enforce this law. The Attorney General and all the Attorney Generals in eight provinces across Canada, they said the Long Gun Registry is costing too much money. It's going to criminalize otherwise law-abiding citizens. No one's following it anyways. No one's, no one's going along with this law. We refuse to enforce it. We're telling our police not to bother. Well, they can do that for the long gun registry, for someone who's in, uh, in a possession of an uh, unregistered long gun. They can do the same thing for someone in possession of cannabis. It's a very, very similar situation. And we have another precedent recently of the province standing up to the federal government in an area of drug policy, and that is the supervised injection site in Vancouver, where the federal government said, this is our jurisdiction. We want to shut that place down. We don't care that it's saving lives and that every study shows it's benefiting the community. We don't like it. We want to shut it down. The province went to court. They fought, and they won. Insight is still there, and the long gun registry is gone. And however you feel about those things, those are examples of the province being able to stand for the federal government. And in both cases, the province has ultimately won those battles. So we can do the same thing here with cannabis in British Columbia. Now, we want to go further than just telling the police to lay off cannabis users. That's a good first step. It acknowledges that we recognize that the war on cannabis is failing, and we're taking cannabis users off the front lines of the war on drugs. We're letting our police focus their resources on more substantive crimes. But we want to go further than that. We want to have a legally regulated system in BC where people can grow their own cannabis in some kind of limited quantities, where they can buy it legally, buy cannabis products and extracts that are labeled and clear and what they are and produced in a, in a safe and responsible manner. So the second part of this legislation, it mandates that the Attorney General of the province demand the federal government change the law. He has to write a letter within a certain amount of time calling on the federal government to change the cannabis laws to either take cannabis out of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act entirely, or to give BC an exemption, which they can do under Section 56. They're allowed to give any person or class of persons an exemption, so they could let us do an experiment in BC and say we're going to let you try something different and see how it goes, or make whatever legislative change necessary so that British Columbia can go further as a province. And then along with that, it sets up a provincial commission. So we have a study, a group of people who get together, go around the province, talk to experts, talk to citizens, figure out what the rules and regulations for legal cannabis could be, because those are provincial jurisdiction. When cannabis is legalized, it's just very similar to alcohol and tobacco. There's some federal laws around importing and exporting and labeling, but for the most part, alcohol and tobacco are provincial jurisdiction, and provinces have the right to set age limits and point of sale and hours of sale and tax rates, and all those things are done provincially for the most part. So we want this commission to figure out, have public hearings, talk to everybody, come to some kind of consensus as to what the rules and regulations around legal marijuana are going to be. And we don't set up what that's going to be in advance, but I know that the model I'll be pushing for is similar to the wine model, like I kind of mentioned earlier. If you want to make wine in your own home, you can do that. There's no big red tape around. There's a limit to how much you can make, and there's a limit that you can't sell it, but if you want to share it with your friends, if you want to do it yourself, you can make more than enough wine to satisfy your own needs. Anybody can set up a winery. There's no limit. There's not like a certain number of wineries. The government doesn't brew wine, nor should the government be growing marijuana themselves. That would be silly. But if you compete as a winery, you've got, there's got to be a market. You've got to follow the rules. If you say your wine's organic, it's got to be organic. You've got to produce it safely and responsibly. And if I'm buying a cannabis product at the store, I want to know how it's grown. I want to label on it the potency. If it's going to extract in some form, I want to label telling me what the perceived effects are going to be and how to use it safely and all that kind of stuff, right? And we need to make allowances for medical use and figure out how we're going to deal with medical users in terms of taxation and access and those things and figure all those rules out. We can do all that. And um, so we got this great law. It would do all these wonderful things. It would decriminalize possession. It would move us on the path of legalization in our province. It would be very symbolically important and practically important. And one thing I'll add is that people sometimes say, 
isn't cannabis already decriminalized in BC? Like, I was smoking a joint, and the cop just told me to put it out, and he didn't charge me or anything. And especially if you're in Vancouver, that's very true. In Vancouver, they lay less than 10 possession charges for cannabis every year. They have a stated policy that they do not want to bust anybody for possession of cannabis. For the most part, they will ignore it entirely, or they'll ask you to put it out if they think you're in a public place and it might be bothering somebody. But they've made a concerted effort, and that's been fairly recently over the last several years that they've made this policy. In the rest of British Columbia, possession charges are skyrocketing. In 2005, there was 1,700 British Columbians charged for cannabis possession. That was actually at a low. It had been slowly but steadily going down. And at that time, the Liberal government federally was talking about decriminalization and it was kind of in the air. So the numbers was <coughs> the numbers were slowly heading downwards. But they were around that range. They hadn't gone over 2,000 people a year for quite a few years before that. 2006, when Harper came into power, the possession charges jumped. Every year since then, they've gone up substantially. By 2010, they had more than doubled. And last year, there was 3,700 possession charges, more than double of 2005, over 10 people a day who were charged for possession. There's also about 20,000 incidences where the police file a report about taking someone's cannabis away in some form. That's a 30% increase over the last that same time period. There has not been a 30% increase in marijuana users. There has not been a doubling in cannabis users. This is not a response to just one people using it. It's clearly the RCMP making an effort to charge more people. And they really shouldn't be doing that. They should, in fact, be responding to the provincial government and what people at BC want. People at BC do not want to be spending double our budget now over this time period on busting pot smokers. And it's very expensive to charge somebody. <clears throat> We've actually got a study going on right now that'll be completed soon with the criminologists at Simon Fraser University to figure out who are these 3,700 people each year and what happens to them. Do they get convicted? And what, 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 what's it costing us to, to enforce these laws? And where is this all going? And I'll say that even if you're not convicted, just being charged for possession can be quite harmful. Just being charged for possession and having the charges dropped can result in not being able to cross the U.S. border. We're very open in sharing information with our American cousins when it comes to Canadians and what our activities have been. So it's, it can be quite harmful in that way. And it's also quite traumatizing as well to be put in prison, often strip searched, held in a cell for quite a long time, being handcuffed in front of your friends and family. All of these things cause other problems and are, and are harmful in themselves, even if you don't get a, a criminal record in the end. But, but anyway, so we've got this law that will make all these changes. It would take that number down from 3,700 charges a year to pretty much zero. It would take that 20,000 number down to pretty much zero. And it would save us a lot of money and, and be a lot of benefit to British Columbians. But how do we get this law passed? What do we do? Hey, thanks for coming. Just grab a seat. Well, Christy Clark could pass this law tomorrow if she wanted to. Nothing special about it, but we have to have a referendum. And if the polls are right and the NDP forms government in the next election, Adrian Dix could also pass this law if he wanted to. There's nothing special about it. It would just take some political courage and some political will. Political courage and will that I feel is sadly lacking in both of our parties right now. We've had many MLAs, four liberal MLAs, come out recently saying they want to decriminalize or legalize marijuana and calling for very similar proposals to what we're calling for. And in the NDP caucus, there's many MLAs also that want to change the laws. And one of them came and spoke at our event in Victoria. Nicholas Simons came and spoke uh, to a crowd of 500 people there, along with everybody else, about the support for the changing of the laws. But the two leaders of the parties, for the most part, Christy Clark will just kind of laugh it off and say it's a, it's a federal issue. Adrian Dix will say, well, I support decriminalization, but it's a federal issue. So they're, they're not willing to make it a provincial issue, like our province did when it come, came to the gun registry or when it came to Insight, when they said, no, this is a provincial issue, because we're the ones paying for it. But anyways, let's, let's assume that our provincial leaders are not going to pass this, although we should certainly be pressuring our MLAs and working on them to get it through. Ultimately, I believe we can do this with the referendum. Now, like I said, it's difficult to get something on the ballot in British Columbia. It's actually harder in our province than any American state or any referendum system in the world that I know of. Ours is harder to get something on the ballot. And the testament to that is that there's only ever been one grassroots-driven referendum in our province, of course, that was the campaign against the HST. Now, we actually have better polling for changing the cannabis laws than we did for getting rid of the HST in terms of support across the province. But what we lack, which the, which the campaign against the HST had, is infrastructure. They had the unions on board. They had the NDP on board. They had a large part of the business community on board. They had a pretty broad coalition of people who know how to get out in the streets and how to get involved and organize people and make stuff happen. But we do have a lot of people who are very excited about changing these laws, and we're also building a coalition of our own. And we're having a lot of success as we go around the province, as we talk to people, getting things on board. The Vancouver Sun has endorsed us, Black Press has endorsed us with a series of editorials. 
We've got a lot of other organized people from all across the political spectrum that are coming in forward and getting involved. But the thing about our referendum system is that nobody really knows how it works because no one's ever does it does it use it very often. But it's got fixed election dates. So the referendum system is entirely separate from the provincial elections. It's entirely its own thing. They're scheduled every three years in September. So the idea was that anything that people have got signatures on every three years, we'd all get together and have a vote on all the various issues. But because they made it so hard to get something on the ballot, those dates go by with nobody knowing that there was supposed to be a vote. So the next one is scheduled for September 2014. That's when the next referendum is scheduled. Regardless of whether we had all of our signatures at hand now or a year from now, the referendum will still be held in September 2014. To get something on the ballot in our province, we need to collect the signatures from 10% of the registered voters in every one of British Columbia's 85 electoral districts. That comes to roughly 400,000 people. And if you just get 9.9% .9 in one electoral district, you fail. You've got to get 10% or more of the registered voters in every one of the 85 electoral districts. It's a very high threshold. It requires people working all over the province. You also only have three months to collect those signatures. You have 90 days from when you start that clock to stop that clock to collect all those signatures around the province. So even if people are out there, you've got to find them, identify them, get them on board, make sure they're a registered voter. It's a big process. So what we did is we took the Central Policing Act, we went to Elections BC, we submitted it, and they actually we submitted an earlier draft, we went back and forth a little bit, we worked out something that their lawyers agreed was jurisdictionally valid for our province. And they said, yeah, you can do this. Let's have a referendum. You can, we must have a, get, get the signatures. They gave us all the stuff, and they started the clock. And we said, OK, thanks. Now we're withdrawing that, because we're not actually going to try to get signatures right now. But even just doing that, that means that Elections BC's lawyers have agreed, these are government, have agreed that this legislation is provincial jurisdiction. So now, even just with that, when Christy and Adrian say, oh, we, it's federal jurisdiction, no, you can do something. You can pass a sensible policing act. We've got confirmation from your own government lawyers that this law is valid. You could decriminalize cannabis today. So that already gives us a strong legal argument to like stand up with this. But it also gives us all the information, all the paperwork we need, so we have an advanced understanding of how this how this all process all, this all works with elections BC. We're going to resubmit this legislation again at the end of August of this year. And for September, October, November of this year, we'll be doing the official signature gathering campaign. So between now and then, our goal is to pre-register people. When you sign up on this, when you sign up on our website, when you get your friends and family to sign on board, you go in our database. We're not sharing it with anybody else, but it lets us keep track of where our supporters are. And then when September comes, we can tell our volunteers, and hopefully a lot of you folks in this room will be volunteers, but we can tell our volunteers, here's the 100 people in your area that said they were going to sign. They're all expecting you to come over. That We've already emailed and called them all. You just got to show up and get them to sign the official form for that area. Every single district has its own form. To be a, a canvasser, you've got to fill out a thing, and I've got to sign a piece of paper. So there's a bit of a process involved. But that's why we're planning it in such a long time in advance. And no one else who's tried a referendum has ever tried it with this kind of system before, of putting in a basically a year of advanced effort and, and building to get to that point. And it's just purely to build the infrastructure that we need across the province. And, uh, so that's what we're trying to do here in British Columbia, to show how we can change the laws, how you can join us in the Sensible BC campaign. And, and I'll just conclude with this. And that's that I've got a daughter who's just turned 15. Some of you here might have kids of your own. Others might hopefully have children one day. And, uh, and you know, when I think back to the 70s, when I was just a little kid, and everyone thought these laws were going to change, and how much harm and misery has come about over these last 30, 40 years because of Canada's prohibition, not just in Canada, but all around the world and the, the many hundreds of thousands of people across Canada that have been charged and convicted and, and the great harms that this causes in our society. And I, I think about my, my daughter and I, and I like to imagine a future one day with her children, that they can grow up in a society that never knows Canada's prohibition. And I like to imagine, and I hope you can imagine this with me, that you're, you're an older person, you're a senior citizen, and your grandchildren's there getting ready to go to school, reading their history book, you know, before the school bus comes, doing some studying. And they, they turn to you and they say, Grandma, Grandpa, I'm, I'm reading in my history book here that the cannabis hemp plant used to be illegal when you were younger and that people would actually go to jail for growing this plant, but I know that my history book's printed on hemp paper and I know that our house is built at a hemp fiber board and I know the bus that takes me to school uses hemp fuel to run on and I know that you use marijuana medicine to treat the aches and pains of being a senior citizen and I'm pretty sure I had hemp seeds in my breakfast, so What's, what's up with that? How could that have been? And I want you to be able to say, yeah, it's true. People did used to go to jail for growing this plant that's 
really the world's most wonderful plan. But you know what? I got involved and I made a difference. And I worked hard so that you would never have to know what it's like to live in a society where you get imprisoned or harassed for what herbal medicine you use or for what plant you grow in your garden. And when Sensible BC came to my town, I pledged that I would work hard and I gathered signatures and I put in a lot of time and a lot of effort. And when I cast that ballot to legalize marijuana in British Columbia in September of 2014, that was the best vote that I ever cast. And that spread across British Columbia, it spread across Canada, it helped spread around the world, and that is why we have legalized cannabis. That is why you don't ever have to know what it's like to live in a world of cannabis prohibition. We can make that dream happen. Let's not have it be the alternate dream or the ultimate nightmare where we tell our grandkids, yeah, sorry that cannabis is still illegal, sorry that a lot of your friends are in prison for smoking pot and using marijuana medicine because we just didn't get around to it. But uh, maybe you guys can, can deal with it now in 2030. Maybe we can change the laws at some point. Let's make it happen now. We're so close to making it happen in British Columbia. It's such a very unique time right now with such broad consensus with all the cities and towns coming on board to vote to change the laws, with political people from both sides of the spectrum coming on board, with Washington and Colorado vote to change the laws. But all that can all slip away. I can easily envision a future where all these gains are lost and where Obama cracks down, or Harper cracks down. We lose what we've built. It's happened before and it can happen again. But I believe we can change this. And I don't believe that naively or innocently. It's going to take a lot of work and a lot of effort. But I think that this is an issue as time has come. And if you're here today, it's because you share that dream with me. So let's make that dream come true. Let's change these laws here in British Columbia. We can do it together. Thank you very much for being here. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about the campaign. Thank you very much. How was that the kickoff? Yeah, it was Golden, and that was a pretty powerful. That was our initial kickoff campaign that right in, at the in Victoria there. And we're going to be actually doing more panels like that uh, that's starting that's in March that's and that's April. Powerful. We're going to try to do about 15 of those in the top 15 areas of the city and have not exactly the same speakers, but a similar kind of thing. He's referring to an event we put on in Victoria. I don't know if anyone else was at that or, or remembers it. But we had a police officer, David Bradser, who's a very brave officer here in Victoria, who, who speaks often against cannabis prohibition and works with a group called Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Uh, we had uh, the mayor of Chosen came and spoke. Uh, that was really nice. And they're the ones that initially put the resolution through that ended up getting through the Union of BC Municipalities, which was uh, a great victory for us. Uh, we had a fellow named Evan Wood speak, who's the guy behind the Stop the Violence campaign, and they're the ones that got a lot of the attorney generals and mayors and other groups on board. Nicola Simons was there, NBP MLA. Uh, Kirk Tucson, who helped write the, or really, he really did write this legislation, and, uh, and it was a really good event. And so we're gonna do another bunch more of those we're just getting our fundraising all in place so we can afford to put them on, and we're going to be able to put on 15 of those, I think, during March and early April. So that'll help keep this out there and put on bigger events. These kind of events, you know, we've had crowds. I normally get 12 to 60 people, depending where we are, what kind of town it is. But uh, it doesn't take a lot of people to get that ball rolling. We're going to be getting bigger. Don't be discouraged by there's only 12 people in the room. I'm very happy to see this turn out. We are definitely on the road to big success. And there's people all across the province who have joined in with this. People are sending us in sign-up sheets all the time. We're building a lot of momentum. And by getting involved in this campaign, you're joining with people. So I've been to like 36 towns. This is number 37 on our stop. And, uh, and people all around British Columbia, from Prince Rupert to, to Prince George to Grand Forks to, to wherever Fernie and to everywhere in this province are getting really excited about this. So I hope that you, know, you feel like you're be part of something bigger than yourselves and part of something that can really make a difference. And uh, I'm just gonna give out my flyer here. I'll just give you, I'll just, that's probably not enough anyway, just take one and pass them around. I'll give you, in there. So I'll give you guys a couple ones to pass them around. So the RPMP will have, would have to abide by a, a provincial Yes, and that's a very common question. People don't have a lot of faith that the RCMP would, would follow through with something like this. But by making it part of the Police Act, um, they, uh, they ha if they didn't abide by it, we actually dealt with it in two ways. They, they would, it would be a, a violation of the Police Act. You could violate complaint, uh, the complaints process, which is not the strongest process out there, but certainly it would be good. However, we also impose a, a paperwork burden on them as well. And that along with being able to file the complaint, if any officer chooses to search, seize, detain, arrest anybody for possession of cannabis, they have to write a detailed report as to why they chose to do that. And that report gets published 
on the government web, on the Ministry of the Attorney General's website with the uh, person who's involved in information removed, and it's made publicly accessible. So even if they do decide to go against it, aside from whatever procedural stuff, they've got to spend three or four hours in the office writing a report as to why they did it, and that it may even be a stronger deterrent in some ways because they don't like doing that, and it definitely will cost them a lot of time and energy and money any time they decide to take someone's cannabis away. So, uh, so I mean, there may be some in the beginning. I'm sure there'll be some court battles or some cops that don't want to do what they're told or whatever. But, but I think we would see that number go from 3,700, or probably by then it'll be over 4,000 because it's been going up every year, down hopefully to a very small number. And for whatever exceptional circumstances, there might be some people that slip through, but we'll work to get it as close to zero as possible. You know, they have the discretion to double it. They have the discretion to half it, right? I mean, there's no, there hasn't been a doubling, and it's purely arbitrary when they decide who to charge and who not to charge. And out of the 20,000 people, and they charge 3,700, like, it depends on which cop you get, and which town you live in, and how old you are, and, all, and how polite you are, and all these other factors, rather than it being, you know, they don't decide that they're gonna charge you with other serious crimes based on those kind of factors, right? You don't see that huge discrepancy anywhere else. You see most times they, if they have the evidence, they'll they'll charge you for stuff. But with pot, it's really really arbitrary, just based on whatever the whatever the cop wants to do. And the prosecutors aren't really acting as a gateway. If, they, if the police bring them charges, they will they will lay them, and they only get paid by the charge. They don't have a lot of motivation to drop charges off of people either, right? But uh, but it's uh, it's shocking how the numbers have gone up so heavily over the last uh, six years. And uh, uh, is there any information from watching? Um, how Washington or Colorado are dealing with it, with their federal similar issue? Uh very much, and actually what we've done is very similar to what they've done there, because in Washington and Colorado, they legalize possession, like we're trying to do, or decriminalize, legalize, whatever. They, everybody can possess. In Colorado, you can actually also grow six plants, which I think is great. Washington doesn't include any provision for personal cultivation, and I think that's an important part of it, even if it's six plants. It helps keep the price down, it helps make sure everybody can afford to get cannabis, and I would, I don't, I would rather limit it by its space than by the number of plants, because people in Colorado will be growing the hugest six plants you can imagine, right? When you're limited to six plants, you're gonna grow really big ones. So it's, it's, you know, it's kind of a weird one. But anyways, that's really positive. And then they have one year in each state to figure out how they're gonna open up these cannabis shops, how they're gonna sell it to people. And there's a lot of stuff to figure out. How, how are you gonna supply it? Who's gonna do it? Is it gonna be one company? Is Monsanto gonna grow all the cannabis? Are you gonna have dozens and small producers growing it? What's the, what's the system gonna be, right? So they've got a year to figure that out. I suspect that the Obama administration is going to fight them on that. They can't really stop them from decriminalizing possession because it's all the state police that enforce that. They could send DEA agents in to bust for possession of pot, but they're not going to go to that extreme. So I think the possession part is going to be allowed. But the, there'll be a fight when it comes to opening up the shops. And what worries me is that the governors in both those states were against these laws. So how hard are they going to fight? At the same time, they know that these laws got more votes than they did. And so if they just say, screw it, we're not gonna do it, they're not gonna get reelected. So they've gotta find that balance. You know, Hopefully it'll be on the side of actually getting these laws put in place. But uh, in Colorado, it's quite, so ours is similar. We're, we don't have quite the same timeline, but there's possession is decriminalized, and then they have about a year or so to have this commission to figure out how to legalize it. And because Washington's a bit ahead of us, we will certainly learn from how they set it up, and we'll see what they do there, and what they do in Colorado. And it's gonna be an ongoing story for the next year or two at least as it, uh, those states as they move forward and they you know have different stages of this, uh, this process get set up and happen right and are the new the changes to the um, medical marijuana cultivation rules in canada are they going to complicate the your act I well know. they're i mean they're separate things i mean so 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 no, our, our thing is kind of an end run around all of that stuff in a way, right? We're trying to bypass Harper, bypass the federal government, make change right here in British Columbia because we're not gonna get any positive change when it comes to cannabis laws under Harper, right? And even under, even if, if Harper hopefully is defeated in 26, uh, 2015, when the next election is. Even if he's defeated and we get, uh, you know, Mulcair or Trudeau or some you know, minority government or whatever, they both said fairly good stuff, both parties. I mean, they've both been you know, fairly good on cannabis issues, but they're not gonna make it a top priority. We're still gonna have to push them into doing it. They'll be a lot more amenable. They won't necessarily fight us in court so much. They wouldn't put mandatory minimums in. You know, I think that either Mulcair or Trudeau would, would get rid of some of those mandatory minimums. They both pledged to do so. They'd probably make a medical marijuana program that worked in a bit better good faith than what we got now. They've 
you know, maybe, I think maybe we've seen the number of charges going down, but they're not going to legalize cannabis unless they're forced into it, because it's just too politically, you also, you're going against the RCMP, and they've got a lot of power, we've seen how they interfere in federal elections sometimes, so, but if we have a referendum in BC, and we change the law here, and then we, and we call upon the federal government, it, it's easier for them to go, well, they had a referendum, let's let this BC try something on their own, and see what happens there, we won't let them bring it into Alberta, and, when we had alcohol prohibition, every province had its own thing, and that's why you couldn't bring alcohol across provincial borders until quite recently, right? So we do have similar laws where you can't bring your BC pot into Alberta until they change the law. That's fine, right? And you don't need to enforce it in any other provinces. But once it comes through in BC, everyone else will want to do it. Within a few years, they'll see the success and the, the tax revenue raised, the savings, the benefits, and so it'll spread across Canada once we do it here. But, but the medical marijuana changes that are coming in are not going to be good for patients. I'd say in some ways it's an improvement over what they have now, but it's not really improvement. It's almost a sideways step in some ways, right? Like, I, I think they should be incorporating dispensaries into the system. I think they should be allowing patients access to, to extracts, and, and which they've been, the court said that should be allowed, and Health Canada's response was fine. You can make your own, right? Kirk Tucson won in court uh, here in Victoria, right, with the case. Owen Smith, the baker from the uh, Victoria Dispensary or Ted Smith's Club. And, um, and, and the, the judge ruled that patients should have the right to a, a, extracts. And the government says, don't smoke marijuana. Here's your dried marijuana buds. Don't smoke it, because smoking's bad. But if you make anything else out of it, you're, break, you're manufacturing marijuana, which you don't have a license to do. And so it's a stupid situation, right? And, and, uh, and so it would make sense if under the new system they would allow patients to buy those kind of things, right? But, and I always say that, you know, I run a medical marijuana dispensary. I would love it if I was put out of business because the government was selling better, cheaper, broader range of products than I could possibly do. That would be a victory if we got shut down because the government was selling high quality marijuana, 30 strains for $3 a gram or something and had all different kinds of extracts and things that we sell. Like, that would be great. But, um, but I don't see that happening anytime soon, right? They're not, they're not really operating in good faith. But, uh, but anyways, the, the changes are coming in 2014. Patients will lose their licenses at that time. No more new licenses after September of this year. And if I was a patient who had invested a lot of time and money in learning how to grow cannabis, buying all these lights and equipment, it's not cheap or easy to grow medical grade marijuana in your own home. Finally, you get some good crops out of it. Then they say, oh, you can't do it anymore. We're taking away your license. Throw away all that stuff. And by the way, your name's on a list of marijuana growers that we have, so you better, we're going to come check, right? Like, that is a difficult situation for somebody to be in and be forced to buy it, uh, especially at the high, I mean, marijuana should be, should be ridiculously cheap. If it was grown openly, there's no reason why the highest quality cannabis shouldn't cost more than the world's best tomatoes or the world's finest oregano or anything like that, right? So it really should cost virtually nothing, uh, as, as much as other, any other vegetable. And the only reason it's expensive is because of prohibition. So if the government's growing it, they don't have to worry about prohibition. They could grow it super cheap. So it's really kind of a, a scam, I think, the way the government's doing it. Do we have until the end of February to give a... Um, uh, a public consultation for the um, the Harbor law that's going to be passed. That's right. Um, what do you advise for us to? We all have the opportunity. All Canadians have the opportunity to write to the government um, and submit our own our own statement. What do you advise that we can write that? That patients should have the right to grow their own cannabis. That they should try to incorporate community-based dispensaries into the medical cannabis system and, and help us be legitimized. And, uh, and really that, you know, I feel that in a way, if, the, if when they had the designated grower program, they limited that to two, they actually limited it to one at a time. A grower could only grow for one patient at a time. We fought that in court in one, so they said, okay, two at a time. If they'd done the opposite, if they said designated grower could only grow for 20 patients at a time, but no less than that, it would mean that nobody, they wouldn't grow it in a home, they'd grow it in a big warehouse or in a place like that. It'd be cheaper for patients because the grower could supply for a lot of people at a time, so the cost would go down, the quality would go up, people would find a person that was reliable for them. They created the system to fail. By only allowing someone to grow for two patients at a time, I know so many patients that are always asking me, how can I find a grower? And the few that I know that are good people are all taken up. And then they, they get someone to grow it for them and they make a deal and that person rips them off or they take some medicine or there's some, some kind of problem. And so they really created it to fail. But ultimately, I think they should, they should be uh, uh, bringing community-based dispensaries into the system and they should be ensuring that people have the right to grow their own medicine. And, and rather than blocking that, they should find a way to do it safely. I think that many of those who are growing their own 
would have been happy to be inspected, to have somebody come by and make sure they're doing it safely. They didn't offer that to, at all to anybody. They totally pushed them out of that system and said, we're not going to do any of that. And then when there's problems, they just wash their hands of it. But I, don't think, I think most growers would be happy to have somebody come and check and make sure it's safe, the same as if you've got an electrical, you've got a power room in your house or something like that, right? But, but cannabis can be grown very, it doesn't, I mean, you can wreck a house growing cannabis. You can wreck a house being a messy pig, too, living there or whatever, right? But you can also grow cannabis in a home very safely and securely in many different ways. And, uh, and they should be pushing towards that kind of thing, encouraging patients to grow it in a safe way. Maybe having seminars for patients, teaching them how to grow cannabis properly. Get them to use this grow boxes and tents you can use that, that you can grow in a plug and play kind of unit that you can grow marijuana very easily in your own home and very safely. And so I'd rather see them encouraging patients, yeah, give them a benefit, you help them. And ultimately when patients use cannabis instead of pharmaceutical drugs, it all saves us a ton of money. We have a lot of patients at our dispensaries who come in and they use all kinds of expensive pharmaceuticals, which they don't pay for, and they get them subsidized by the government. They would rather throw those away and pay for their own, out of their own pocket for marijuana medicine because they think it helps them better. And if they're not using pharmaceuticals and they're saving the government and taxpayers a ton of money, they're happier, we're all happier. If, they, if we would sort of subsidize cannabis or bring it into the system like that uh, in a positive way, but I think that would be a great benefit as well. So, Ultimately, I think cannabis should be available as a non-prescription medication for the most part, and it should be sold in that manner. And maybe some really strong extracts. Similar to Tylenol. I would like say. Extra it, I think it depends on the, the it depends on the potency and the dosage, right? And all accounts is very safe. Certainly, you can't really die from an overdose of cannabis taking too much, but you can get some things that have very powerful psychoactive effects, or that will knock you unconscious or whatever in large doses. So. I think that moderate doses, things that are less psychoactive, we sell a cream at our dispensary, a marijuana-infused cream. It doesn't get you high. Maybe if you ate like a whole bunch of it, you'd probably throw up before you got any kind of effect. But you rub this cream on your body, it's incredible for eczema, for psoriasis, for arthritis, for top of like localized pain, muscle problems. It's an incredible medicine. You could sell that, you could put it on babies, you could sell that in the London drugs or whatever, over the, and I think in a fully legalized system, that would be the most popular marijuana product. Everybody would use that stuff. People wouldn't even know there was cannabis in it. It would just be you know, miracle cream and people would use it in a very wide range. That should be available without prescription anywhere. A really strong psychoactive cookie that's gonna make you hallucinate when you eat it, maybe that should have a restriction or 18 years or older or some kind of, you know, like if something's really strong in that sense, I don't know if it should be well, we unlimited, but. Things we have to ask the pharmacist for, like codeine and. Yeah, I mean, that kind of stuff. So with cannabis, it doesn't really, you don't overdose or kill you, but I mean, generally speaking, I'd say the stronger something is, or the more dangerous it is, the more it should be not banned, but like restricted to make sure it's done safely and properly. You need more regulations around it, right? So that's how we do it with, maybe not perfectly, but with prescription and non-prescription drugs, right? The more dangerous they're supposed to be, the more guidance you need. We don't ban them, but we say, well, you gotta get a doctor to help you with it, or you gotta talk to the pharmacist or whatever. So cannabis is safer than most of those things, and that's so it requires less control, but I would say maybe they're really strong substance. So at least there'll be a warning label saying, don't you know, drive after eating this cookie, make sure you have, you know, whatever, that kind of stuff, right? To be safe in that regard. What kind of things do you, the, uh, I guess would be the, um, conservative uh, government would, they fear fear about this thing that they're thinking that um, it's just so bad. What is the, um, is there like a specific um, aspect of it that um, they would, all the conservative government would say, okay, we're gonna have to um, criminalize a major, like, arrest all these people for it, so. Not quite sure what you're asking me, like what's the conservative argument against legalization you mean, or? Um, yeah, what is their, their stepping point, their main, um, so we can really have to sell them? Um, I, 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 would, I would say there's nothing conservative about cannabis legalization or prohibition, and that many conservatives and right-wingers are supporting legalization. The Conservative Party of Canada is stridently against cannabis and against legalization of pro-drug war, but a lot of right-wingers support legalization. The Fraser Institute, one of the most well-known far-right uh, think tanks in North Canada, you know, they strongly support legalization. I've talked about it many times. When Joe Clark, he was a progressive conservative, but still conservative, you know, he supported legalization of cannabis. There's one guy in the, in the Harper Caucus named Scott Reed. He's the only sort of last of the libertarian type conservatives in there. He supports legalization of marijuana and really ending the whole war on drugs and has talked, he's not like super outspoken about it, but he's talked about it. He's come to cross party events and panels and he's well educated about the issue and can talk very coherently about it. He's the only guy in the caucus and he's not ever gonna be a cabinet minister, 
probably because of that, but he's kind of like their token libertarian guy, right? But I would say there's nothing inherently like connecting the right wing philosophy and prohibition, and that especially the libertarian types on the right are often in favor of you know, legalizing everything, really, right? But they don't typically run the political parties. They don't dominate the political parties right now. But the conservatives, I, I think that people say, well, legalization would make the government a ton of money, right? It would make them all this cash, and that's true. But prohibition makes their politicians' friends a lot of money. Prohibition makes corporations a lot of money. Whether it's the drug testers, whether it's the prison construction, whether it's the, the guards, whether there's a lot of areas, whether That's it's the pharmaceutical yeah. industry and the petrochemical industry, depending on how deep you want to see these things go, and they go pretty deep, I would say. If you look at who funds groups like Partnership for a Drug-Free America and where their money comes from, they're quite open about it. And alcohol, tobacco, pharmaceuticals, petroleum products, groups that were threatened by cannabis and by legalization, uh, ending the drug war and that, groups that, that benefit from that. And there's a lot of them. And so I, I think that that's part of the problem, is that a lot of people profit off of cannabis. Policing organizations in Canada, the RCMP especially, from day one, the RCMP has been very intertwined with the war on drugs. From the very beginning, if we hadn't, if, if uh, William Lyon Mackenzie King hadn't passed Canada's first drug prohibition law in Canada in 1908, we would not even have the RCMP today. They really justified their early existence by being a national force to fight the war on drugs. And every step of the way, the RCMP has been there saying, Drug users, marijuana smokers, opium smokers are dishonest, disreputable, bad people of no morals. They will lie and cheat and steal to get their marijuana, to get their drugs. Every step of the way, they've always called for stricter laws, longer sentences, more tools. Uh, and they have been the number one proponents. And then when you, when you challenge them, they always say, we don't make the laws. We just enforce the laws. We don't make the laws at all. But actually, they don't make the laws, but they have a lot of pressure. And then they've always lobbied for more prohibition and more drug laws. So that's why people like David Bratzer, who, who is a Victoria police officer who speaks against prohibition, is so brave, really, and he constantly gets harassed by his chief of police to not speak his mind on this issue. He was saying the opposite. When he, if he went and talked and said, oh, war on drugs is great, marijuana focus is great, they'd be happy to let him speak. It's not that he's voicing a political opinion, it's that he's voicing the wrong political opinion, that he gets punished and, and harassed by his superiors. So, but the police are one of the biggest lobbies and have always been for the last hundred years in Canada to support prohibition and more prohibition. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, you mentioned that taxation thing. Like I heard they down in the States they're making over 500 mil or something like that on the taxation of that. Isn't that an argument enough just for us? You know, like with that amount of money, you could redo a lot of stuff up here. You know? I think you're actually, there was a study recently showing that that would generate roughly 500 million in BC.